We're going to continue today our study of the Beatitudes of Jesus from Matthew 5 as part of the Sermon on the Mount. And this morning, we're going to talk about the fullness of being hungry. If you want to take out the pink page from your bulletin, follow along. That would be great. Today's subject is appetites. Appetites. What did you have an appetite for this week? Did you have an appetite for anything special this week? A hunger, a thirst for anything special? See, I did. I had this appetite because I had a couple of meetings here uh, last month. And uh, because I you know, can choose where to have my meetings, I had a couple, app- a couple of meetings at A&W. Yeah, we don't go to A&W very much at all. And, and so I, I just, because of that, I got a hankering. Even yesterday, 5 o'clock, you know, I had this hankering for a nice cold A&W root beer in a, a frosty mug. Can you see that frost? Isn't that nice? I thought, oh, man, wouldn't that be great? Okay, I, I want you to hear this. Oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah. I won't tease you. Yet. Wow. What do you have a hankering for? What do you got an appetite for? What do you have a thirst for? We've been walking through the Beatitudes, and here today, it actually, some of the worst ones where you got an appetite for something and you just can't get it, right? You just can't have it. Like when there's only one can of something. You know what I, what I mean, right? We've been looking at the Beatitudes, and we've been learning amazing things. Today we're on the fourth Beatitude, and it changes from a focus on us to a focus on God. Or the first three Beatitudes, well, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we learned that that means we're spiritually poor, that we have to recognize that we have nothing, absolutely nothing that can get us into heaven. There's no goodness, there's no goods, there's nothing that we can give to make God take us into heaven. Instead, we have to simply fall on his mercy and ask him to let us in. It's all about what he did through Jesus on the cross and not about what we do. Amen? You don't seem convinced. Amen? We are spiritually poor. And when we recognize that, we can get to heaven Indeed, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We saw next that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And when we recognize and mourn over our sin and our guilt and the wrong things we've done, only then can we turn to God for forgiveness and receive that forgiveness. It's great. Last week, we talked about blessed are the meek. And we saw that meekness isn't being a, a doormat, a pushover. Meekness is actually to have power, to have authority, but have it under control, to use it when God would have you use it. And we had two visitors last week, remember? We had Moses come in here, and Moses came and and talked to us about how he had all this anger problem, but he didn't have it under control. He slammed the rocks with his rod, and God said, hey, man, you're not going to make it into the promised land. But we saw David visit us as well last week, who said, I had an opportunity to kill my arch enemy, King Saul, who was trying to kill me, but instead... I said, whoa, 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 I'm going to hold back. I'm going to control that anger, and instead, I'm going to wait for God's timing and do things God's way, and that's meekness. Now, today, we're going to turn to the fourth beatitude. Let's read it together. One, two, three. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I love that. That's great. Now, we don't really understand hunger and thirst so well. I don't think we get it so much. If we were back in Jesus' day, if we were over in the Middle East, there are famines that happen all the time. People genuinely starving and hungry, and that's probably not most of us. Most of us have never truly been starving. Remember the story of Joseph we talked about a couple of weeks ago? His brothers sold him as a slave off to Egypt. Remember that? Well, his brothers eventually had to go to Egypt and grovel in front of him. Why? Because there was a worldwide famine. They had to go actually to a whole other country to find food. It was so bad. That hasn't happened to most of us. We haven't had that experience. Jesus' day, a couple of things. First of all, we don't understand what it's like to truly starve. We haven't lived through a famine. 
And in Jesus' day, the average working person only earned enough to eat meat once a week. They didn't have fridges. They didn't have preservatives except some salt on things to make them last at all. So when Jesus said, teach us to pray, and said, say it with me, give us today our daily bread, that was a literal prayer. People who labored, they were laboring for their food that day in many cases. So this prayer was, God, it's only by your mercy that I'm going to have food to eat today. And I don't think we really understand that at all, do you? I don't think we do. So when Jesus says we need to hunger and thirst for righteousness, we don't have that idea of what real hunger is, a real thirst like people who are in the desert. Why, if you were over there in the Middle East and you're traveling between two towns, it's arid, it's dry, there is desert in most places. And if you're driving between two cities, well, today you'd be in a car, maybe an air-conditioned tour bus or something. But in that day... If you got caught in one of the frequent windstorms, you would have to quickly pull something around your face because that sand would quickly get in your nostrils and you would suffocate. It's that bad. And you would need a drink of water and you'd be passionate about that because you had to have it for life or death. It's amazing. So when Jesus says to them, you need to hunger, you need to thirst for righteousness, It meant way more to them than it does to us. And this morning, by the time we're done, I I hope we understand afresh what it means for us to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. Now, I hunger, thirst. We don't get it. I I, I had a rough week. Yesterday, I did want a, a root beer, and I didn't have one. Yeah, it was a bit of a tragedy. Earlier in the week, I had, I had been working at the church, and I kind of worked right through lunch, and, and I actually missed a meal. I know you're saying, it doesn't look like you've missed too many, <laughs> because I haven't. But we, we need to understand what Jesus is saying, to have a real hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Two things, I think. Number one, in your notes, if you've got your pen handy, first, it's a matter of desire. It's a matter of desire. You know, there's no end to the appetites we have today. And we've got appetites for all kinds of stuff. I got to have these new clothes. Why, I need to see this movie. This food looks amazing. Look at how that is there on TV. I got to have that experience. I need this new gadget. Now, It's easy to blame the media because that's actually their job to make us think we need stuff, right? It's their job. And I'd say they do a pretty good job of it. Yeah, you need this. You got to have that. Why didn't you go here? I mean, it's amazing stuff. But we are supposed to hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness. Not stuff and experiences. Righteousness. I think if we were to write down, each of us, the various desires that we had this week it might be various things like, you know, to see this show, go to this movie perhaps, play hockey, go on this date with this person, get a raise at work. But I wonder where the desire of get to know God better, do what God wants me to do, I wonder where that would come on our lists. Where would that come on my list today? See, here's what Jesus says. This is what God says in the Bible. The psalmist writes in Psalm 42 this, as the deer, let's read this together. This is a great verse. You know this. As the deer pants for streams of water, say it, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I mean, can we say that? Here's this deer, it's been running from the hunter, and oh, it's panting. Can't get enough of God and get God soon enough. Is that us? I wonder. It should be. You see, to hunger and thirst for righteousness means to desire and do what's right before God and to desire for God himself, both. A greater desire for God and a great desire for what God wants of me as well. Years ago when our kids were little, uh, Lynette was actually pregnant with Wendy, and we thought we wanted to do one last special thing kind of before we have a fourth baby, and then our lives are over, right? So, 
So we thought, yeah, let's, we, and there was this Christian singer named Brian Duncan. Probably you never heard of him, Brian Duncan. Amazing, little jazz, little rock. It was great. We wanted to see him. He was going to be in Toronto. It was great. We only had a couple of problems. One, Lynette was nine months pregnant. Two, my parents couldn't come and babysit the other three kids because they were coming when the baby came to stay with us for a week. Three, there was a youth retreat over in Kitchener at our sister church. And back then the church was little and I was the only guy. And so I was youth and I was everything. And so like, turned out, if we're going to see this concert, I, I would have to drive youth to Kitchener and drive back and get Lynette, and then take her, oh, my, get my sister Cindy, she was going to babysit, go to Toronto, go to this concert, come back to Guelph, go back to Kitchener, because there was a kid that couldn't stay overnight, bring them back and everything. I'm not sure when I slept that night before church the next day, but we wanted to go to this concert so bad that it was worth whatever it took to get there. Have you ever wanted to do something so badly you made all these little complicated plans to make sure it happens? Have you? See people nodding all over. I think that's a good question for us. See, we say we'd like to get to know God better, but how much? How much do we want to get to know God better? What would I do to get to know God better? What would I do? I mean, we would make all these plans to do whatever we have an appetite for, but I think when it comes to God, many of us, any little roadblock keeps us from spending a little more time praying or to spend that devotional time reading the word. Boy, if it's something we really want, if we've got an appetite for it, a desire for it, a hunger for it, we'll move mountains to do it until it comes to God. And, and I don't think that's right. Do I have the same atti- atti- appetite to get to know God better that I did to go see that concert? Huh. St. Augustine once said, thirst, now you gotta, you got to think about this for a moment, Thirst was made for water as a man was made for God. Think about that. Thirst was made for water. Gotta have it. As a man was made for God, gotta have him. Absolutely. That reminds me. That's thirst. Boy. Mmm. Oh. Wow. I have another can I'm going to auction off at the end of the morning. <laughs> What do you have a thirst for? See, we were made to worship God. The basic fulfillment and satisfaction in life comes from us worshiping God. That's why we were made. And things work when they're used the way they were made. And that is us today. Now, I got some good news for you this morning. Some of us were raised in some homes where, you know, it's got to be like this. And boy, you get trouble if you mess up in any single way at all. But I want you to know this. The beatitude does not say... Blessed are those who are perfectly righteous. Aren't you glad? Who here is perfect in their righteousness, in their goodness, in everything they do? Anybody? Anybody? No? See no hands? Well, aren't you glad the beatitude doesn't say, blessed are those who are perfect, perfectly righteous, but it says, blessed are those who, what? Hunger and Thirst for righteousness. See, God is not into the, the attainment part because we won't be perfect until we're heaven. But do you have the hunger? Are you trying? Are you doing what you can, that thirst for God? Not blessed are those who have a perfect life. No, blessed are those who have that hunger and they're trying to satisfy it with an appetite for God. And I just say that to encourage you because God wants you to have a hunger and a thirst for him and follow that up, not perfection, Some of you have such guilt complexes, such guilt feelings, and God would say, I forgive you. Just follow that hunger. Develop that thirst for me. Worldly desires, if you don't get them, you're frustrated, you're unfulfilled. But with God, you're fulfilled even just by following that hunger that you have for him. So it's a matter of desire, first of all. It's a matter of desire, not attainment. Secondly, it's a matter of degree. A hunger and thirst for God is a matter of degree as well. What was it that caused the early Christians to meet every single night, to gather together in homes or in the temple courts? What caused them to risk their family relationships? They'd get disowned if they became a Christian. What caused them to risk their jobs, which they would lose if somebody found out they were a follower of of this, this Yeshua, this Jesus? 
What caused them to risk their lives if they were in Rome? And Nero could have snatched them up and, and tied them to a post and used them as a torch for his garden parties. Risk their lives. What caused that? It was a hunger and a thirst for God, a complete hunger. They were so consumed with knowing him, they would risk and do anything. It's amazing. And again, I, I look in the mirror and I have to say, how consumed am I? Uh, to what degree do I desire God to spend time with him, to know him, to do what he wants? To what degree? Now, there's a verse in the Old Testament. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus calls this next verse the greatest commandment. Let's read this together too. Ready? One, two, three. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, I love that because when we talk about the degree of our hunger and thirst for God, what does this say? You love him with all your heart and with all all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, what's interesting here is that in each of these first four Beatitudes we've looked at, Jesus chooses the strongest possible word. The strongest possible word. We've seen that the last three weeks, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't pick the word that means the, the ones who have a little bit or only a little. No, he picks the word that says you have nothing, abject poverty, absolutely nothing, and of course, spiritually, to give to God. He uses the same thing here. It's the strongest word, that you want everything from God. You want all God has. You want to do all that God wants for you, not just a little bit, all of it you want. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say you invited me over for dinner today, Hint, hint. No hint. You say you invited me over for dinner, and we're sitting there at the dining room table, and like, oh, you got a roast on. Oh, that smells delicious. Whoa, and it looks delicious. Oh, that's great. And, and after somebody prayed, said grace, you know, I said, wow, pass all of the roast over here to me. You know, and while you're at it, pass me all the rolls, all the buns. I want all of them too. What would you say? Well, you might not say anything, but I know what you'd be thinking. But that's actually the idea here. I want all of God. I want everything I can. I want to do all of what he wants for me. I want that, I have that hunger, that thirst for him to the point that I'm only satisfied with him and all that he has for me, everything that he has for me. That's what I want. Pass it all to me, God, all I've got. See, I think... We approach hunger and thirst for all that's right. Not just some of God, not just some of what's right before him, but all that's right. Here's the problem. I think we as Christians treat life like a buffet. We treat the Christian life like a buffet. We only take what we want. I want a little bit of this, just a little bit of that. You know, like, yikes. I was thinking back again to uh, when our kids were very little, and, and one time we went to a, a, a Chinese restaurant, a buffet, kind of like the Mandarin up there, but the Mandarin wasn't around then, so it was a similar place. And We got the kids, and we took them there, and uh, I don't know what the special occasion was, but we said, okay, now each of you, you need to go around, and you need to try one of, or a little bit of a whole bunch of things, you know, and after you've tried a bunch of stuff, because, you know, like tons of things, right? You've all been, who's been to a buffet? Everybody, right? Try one of, a bunch of little stuff, and then after that, you can eat whatever you want. Go back, get whatever you want. Does that sound fair? So one of our daughters, who will go nameless, <laughs> she's got her plate, and we're walking around, and, you know, here's one shrimp, you know, and one piece of beef, and one, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and <clears throat> sat down at the table, ate all that up. And said, now can I go get whatever I want? Yeah, absolutely. You know, hoping that they've tried something new. It's going to be great. Now, I'm sitting there and remembering how much I'm paying for this whole, you know, everything that's out there. And watching as my daughter comes back and finishes the rest of the meal eating only Jello. <laughs> wow. But you know what? 
I wonder if God's not up there looking down at us and saying, I've got this for you and this for you and this for you and this for you. And all you're doing is one thing, you know, like, ah, I wonder what God's thinking. You know, he's got so much for us. And, 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 and yet here we are and, and we're saying, well, you know, uh, it's a buffet. I just pick and choose, take it or leave it, whatever. You know, like I, I'll, I'll come to church on Sunday if, you know, if I don't sleep in, if I didn't have a late night, if I feel like it, you know. I'll, I'll read my Bible, you know, maybe if there's nothing good on TV, you know. Like I, I might visit that person I've been meaning to visit, you know, like uh, if I can find a clear spot in my calendar and like, and God's up there saying, like, you can grow through all these things. You know, I, I might take some time to pray, you know, if I, if I don't get too tired, you know. Like, and I wonder if God's up there, but you got one little thing you do maybe each week. You're eating jello, perhaps, you know, when you've got so much that I have for you. Do we hunger? I mean, the hunger like they had. Do we thirst? We've got to have God. We've got to have you. Do we hunger and thirst after righteousness? Or is it just a little buffet? Take it, leave it, pick and choose. I had somebody actually this year, I had contacted them to say, you know, I've missed you. I haven't seen you around for a while. And you know what he said to me? Yeah, well, church isn't doing it for me anymore. A, I don't know what that even means. B, so... So church is supposed to be like, like maybe going to a show that kind of, you know, gooses you here. So you're, woo, you know, like is, what? It's not about what God says when he commands us to, to gather together and not get out of the habit. When God commands us to come, to worship, to learn, to encourage each other. And he says, do it all the more as you see the evil days approach. It's just, yeah, it's all about you and, yeah, whether or not it does it for you. Wow. Now, we do try to keep it exciting and not boring, but still, it's not so much about you, but about God. Do you have the hunger and thirst? I mean, think about it. Do I thirst for God like somebody walking in a desert? Do I thirst for him like that? Wow. I mean, what does God want to happen in my life? What does God want for me? What does God have for me? What are we focusing on in life? Now, in 1985, I saw a commercial on TV for a new car, brand new car. 1985, 75 actually, 1975. I'm older than you think. I know, I only look 37, I know. I saw this car, it was amazing. British sports car, remember the, the, the MG and the MG6, you know, the Triumph 6? This was this fantastic yellow and black, wedge-shaped car. It was a Triumph TR7. I'll come back to that. It was a Triumph TR7. Like even 45 years later, that car looks pretty cool, doesn't it? 45 years later. I mean, it was the commercial, it was driving around and stuff, like the headlights went up and down and stuff, and, and it drove into this wedge-shaped garage. I thought that was so cool. I mean, man, I, wow, I want one of those. That's so amazing. Two problems. One, I was 18, and two, I was broke. Well, you know what? I got a poster of that car. I put it up in my room with all the other posters my mom didn't like, and uh, had that. It was like, wow. So I saw this car every day. I saw this on the poster. I always thought, man, I, one day, one day, you know, I'd like to have that car. Well, six years later, now you think, well, wait a minute. I thought you were a poor pastor, you know, you're going to school and all that stuff. Yeah, 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 that's all true. But God does miracles. One day I was visiting the junkyard, the wreckers in, in Fort Erie, and I saw they had two of these. One was smashed in the front and one was smashed in the back. Perfect! They chopped them both in half and put them together and painted it and voila! I got it for a song. Yes, my dream car. Lynette and I went on our honeymoon in that car. That was cool. Now, all the good things come to an end. Two years later, you know, here comes David. <laughs> Two-seat car, baby. I had to sell it, but I forgive you, David. I forgive you. 
Actually, because I got it in the junkyard, I sold it for more than I paid for it. That was pretty cool. You know what? I had seen it. I thought this was cool. I had this desire for this. I had it in front of me. I kept watching. And eventually, you know, it was cool. I got it for three years. That was amazing. I wonder, I wonder what each of us are focusing on. And it's okay to have certain appetites and stuff. And maybe, maybe you've got your eye on, you know, you know, a certain new car or something or something you want. It's okay as long as that's not your main top focus in life. I mean, while I was saving and working for this, I was going to Bible college to get ready to be a pastor, right? So where are your priorities? What's the top thing that you would be living for and working for? Hopefully it's not a car. Now, you might say, okay, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, what does that mean, hunger and thirst for righteousness? How, how does that apply to my life? Let me give you a quick example of what you can do. Here is a passage that I'm sure is familiar to you. Our Father who art in heaven. Have you heard of that? Anybody? Yeah? Of course. Here's what you can do. You can do this anywhere. But sit down perhaps this afternoon with your Bible. And this is Matthew 6. This is the next chapter. Same Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, and, and walk through this with him. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Start with praise, thanksgiving. God, thank you for who you are. Thanks to you're holy. And, and, and because of that, I can count on you. You're the same all the time. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Lord, what is it you want me to do? I mean, where can I obey you that maybe I haven't? I, I want your will in my life. Give us today our daily bread. God, thank you for everything I have. The bread, uh, the meat, the food, uh, the house, it's getting colder out. I've got a warm house. God, thank you for all that I have physically. Forgive us our debts as we also forget of our debtors. Lord, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you died for me. And Lord, when you forgive all my sins, like who is that person that, that maybe I'm having a hard time forgiving? Would you help me with that? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, everybody's tempted, but we're all tempted differently. Lord, you know where my temptation is. Help me to be strong. Help, help me to not go to that place or be with that person if I always fall when I'm with them. You, know? you could pray through this and say, God, how do I have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, and how can even something like the Lord's Prayer help me to learn and grow? What would you do? What could you do for that? See, blessed are those who develop an intense hunger and thirst for God and for what's right in God's eyes, for they will be filled. Have you developed? Are you developing an intense hunger and thirst for God? What's in front of you? Hopefully not, you know, the poster of a car, but what's in front of you today? Is God's word there, for instance? Now it says, they will be filled. So God promises fulfillment if we do this. Turn the page over if you've got it. See, the people who are going to be fulfilled in life are those who, more than anything else, have a desire to have all God wants for them and to give all to him as well. So the people who are going to do that. Now, in the contrast to that, we've got a world of unfulfilled people. A world of unfulfilled people. People who, when they desire the wrong things or they're in the wrong priority, I mean, maybe these earthly things are top of the list, the more they try to fill their appetites and the desires, the less satisfied they are. Isn't that the way it works? The more I get, the more I want. That's true with earthly things. The more I get, the more I want. Let me give you a couple examples. It might help. I want a salary raise. Lord, I want a raise in my salary. I want a big raise. And a few years ago, you got that raise. Amazing. How are you feeling today? You want another raise. Is that right? Maybe you went to the casino. You got the slot machine. You're thinking, you know, like, you know, once I win, it pays off. I get $25 worth of nickels. I'll quit. Do people quit? No, they keep feeding it in. There are people, they are spending literally $100, $200 on lottery tickets every paycheck. And every once in a while, somebody, you know, I won $250. And you know what people do with that? Usually, usually, mostly, they use it to buy more lottery tickets. It's so true. Oh, if only I could marry that dream person. Oh, I got that dream person. Oh, they married. Life would be perfect. 
Five years later, why are you whining and grumbling about them? I thought life was going to be perfect. You know what? Everything external will not satisfy. Only God brings blessing, not just up and down happiness. It's the way it works. Let me give you one more. You're on strike. You want better work conditions. You know, you know more work benefits. You want a raise, and, and that's great. You get that raise. You get the uh, better working conditions, and what happens three years later? You want more benefits. You want a higher raise. It's just life. I'm not saying any of that stuff is bad, okay? But, well, no, some of it is bad, actually. You should not be wasting all your money on lottery tickets. Agreed? Agreed? But we have some natural desires. And they can be okay. It's great to have a good relationship. It's good to have a good job. It's great to have a a nice house. Those things are fine. But where are they on your priority list? And where does God fall in? Is he even on the list today of the things you're hoping for that you have a hunger for? See, here's the deal. Worldly things I desire so deeply today aren't enough tomorrow. It's the case. Now, in contrast, an appetite for God might not necessarily be natural. I mean, I have to work it. I have to plan time to spend with him. But it's extremely healthy, extremely healthy. And it would lead to blessedness, not just happiness that comes and goes, and joy and contentment and peace. It's amazing. And I want to be contented inside instead of fermented inside. Where I'm always burbling, bubbling and gurgling and, you know, I'm never happy with everything. And it only comes when I find Jesus. If you're putting your, your hope and, and your life foundation on a relationship or a job or a house or a new mate, those things are temporary and they won't last. Fulfilled people? Well, fulfilled people know the key to fulfillment and it's this. Blessed are those who have an intense desire for God. The God who doesn't change. Intense for God. And as that happens and you reach for God with all you have, you'll find the gusto and the contentment of God and you'll be filled. You'll be filled. So let me give you a few points. I hopefully will be helpful for some of you. Number one, don't settle for seeking happiness. I mean, happiness comes and go. Go is seek blessedness from God. Happiness is external things. Blessedness is God in you your hunger and thirst for him. Don't seek for, settle for seeking fulfillment, okay, that I'm going to be fulfilled. No, seek God. And when you have him and know him, even that hunger for him will give you fulfillment. And don't seek to be perfect, okay? You'll just get frustrated. Instead, seek to develop your appetite for God. And when your appetite for God grows, oh my, then you will live a life more and more like Jesus because you love him and you want to be like him day by day. Let's go back to that Deuteronomy 6 passage. Love the Lord your God with all your, help me here, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Well, what does that mean? This is just like the beatitude Jesus is saying. With love him with everything. I have the hunger and thirst for him. You need to be saying to him, God, what do you think about this? God, what do you think about that? How important should this be in my life? Love him with all your heart. That includes your feelings and your passions. Love him with all your soul. That's the basic sense of being. Do you love him more than your desires for anything, like food and water, more than your sex drive, more than your desire for friends, more than anything else is your desire for God? Love him with all your strength. That's your energy and your actions, your actions. So folks, I don't want anyone leaving this morning and saying, yes, I'd like to know and love God more, but take no action on it, all right? And without thinking about it this week and contemplating how it works and and trying to apply it to your situation and and doing something about it, it, it's intention without action. And there's a gap for a lot of people. I got these intentions, but I never do anything. Don't let that be you today. What energy can you put into getting to know God better this week? Maybe take an evening. Sit down and, and, and look at the Lord's Prayer. and Walk through it for yourself. Look, look at verses about righteousness and see what that would mean for you. People who want something, do something. 
They don't just sit passively at home. Talked to somebody not too long ago. You want a new kitchen? Yeah, well, you plan for it. You save up for it. You get plans, you know, and everything. You do something. You don't just sit in the living room and say, when's that new kitchen coming? You want to get to know better, to have a hunger and thirst for God, which will give you a real blessedness and foundation of joy. What will you do about it? What will you do? I want to share with you one last story before we close. This is a great story. You're familiar with how it starts. People are following Jesus all over. He's teaching them. It's amazing. But now the day has gone by. They're hungry. They're starving. What are we going to feed them? And there's a little boy with his lunch of five loaves and two fish, right? And Jesus blesses it, breaks it. It feeds thousands, and there's plenty left over. It's amazing stuff. Well, Jesus, while they're all sitting around, you know, like rubbing their bellies, Jesus crosses the lake, the Sea of Galilee. And here's what we read. When they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get over here? And Jesus answered, listen to this, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you what? Ate the loaves and had your fill. You're, you're only looking at me for a free lunch. You only care about you and all of your stuff and your appetites. Uh, only your physical desires. And I, Okay, now we look at them and we think, shame, shame, but how many of us, our relationship with God really is about our physical desires? Think about it. What are your prayers always about? Are they about jobs, relationships, health, all these personal and physical things? Is that what most of our prayers are about? Oh my goodness, we're no better than them. Look how Jesus continues. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then Jesus declared what? I am the bread of life. And look at this. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness they will be filled. Now, you can go home this morning, and you can say, well, I don't know, Christianity hasn't been so fulfilling to me. I mean, I go every Sunday when I want to and all. Or you can go home, and you can say, Jesus, increase my appetite for righteousness. I want it. I want you more than anything else. I want all that you have for me. I I want to give all of me to you. Why don't you go home today, this afternoon, and make a list of all the things you're going to hunger for and reach for this week more than anything else. And at the top of that list, underlying the part that says, I'm going to have an appetite for Jesus and all that he wants for me. I want to have an appetite for God the Father and to know him better. I want to have an appetite for the Holy Spirit to do whatever he tells me this week. And see if that doesn't change your sense of contentment and fulfillment this week. I guarantee it will. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your words are powerful. Your words are powerful. And you tell us, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not little hunger like we missed a meal. It's like hunger like we're starved. We have to have it to live. And God, we have to have you to live. It's true. And so I thank you this morning that we can have that hunger. We can have that thirst. And we can be filled, as the verse says, with joy blessedness with contentment, but if God is not going to happen by wishes or hopes or words, it'll be happening with action if we were to take some time. Take some time. As if we were planning some great outing we wanted and we'll do anything to get there. Lord, help it to be what we do to make some time here this week with you. To pray. To read your word to listen for you to talk to us. God, we are grateful for what you do and how you change us as we truly get to know you 
and have that hunger and thirst for righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.